Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. Produced Friday, October 23. Good evening, I'm Louis Rukeyser. This is Wall Street Week. Welcome back. Okay, let's start with what's really important tonight. It's just your money, not your life. Everybody who really loved you a week ago still loves you tonight. And that's a heck of a lot more important than the numbers on a brokerage statement. The robins will sing, the crocuses will bloom, babies will gurgle, and puppies will curl up in your lap and drift happily to sleep, even when the stock market goes temporarily insane. And now that that's all fully in perspective, let me say, ouch, and eek, and medic. Tonight we're going to try to make sense out of mass hysteria to look behind the crash of 87. And most perilous, but most important of all, to look ahead. In that effort, our program tonight will be a special one, in keeping with a week that was in many ways the most unusual in all the millennia of investing. Our regularly scheduled program on food stocks has been postponed till December. Instead, tonight, we'll try to give you food for thought about Wall Street's record case of indigestion. In place of our usual format, I'll be talking with three genuine titans of investing. The boss of America's largest brokerage firm, the greatest mutual fund manager of the past generation, and a portfolio strategist whose investment decisions move billions. Meanwhile, let's keep the windows sealed and our hearts calm. For in the immortal words quoted by Adlai Stevenson, I'm too old to cry, but it hurts too much to laugh. It seems as if everyone in America with access to a microphone has been telling us this week with stunning hindsight precisely why the Dow Jones Industrials took a record 508-point, 22.6% nosedive Monday. We heard about rising interest rates. We heard about the trade deficit. We heard about the budget problem. We heard about leadership worries. And if we're to believe last night's presidential news conference, most of my colleagues in the Washington press corps appear to be convinced that the root of the problem is that we just haven't raised taxes enough. All fascinating theories to be sure, but the difficulty is that none of these problems was born at 9.30 Eastern time Monday morning. Indeed, the only major external developments over the weekend were the U.S. attack in the Persian Gulf and Treasury Secretary Jim Baker, with his inimitable sense of timing, starting a brief public feud with the monetary authorities in West Germany. He was, of course, joined in financial expertise by the wizards of ways and means, who seemed to think this was a splendid time to be hitting the markets with new anti-takeover taxes. Time alone will tell whether Black Monday enters the history book as the day American confidence was so shaken that a premature recession resulted, or merely as the day the computers went wild and through the wonders of so-called program trading, turned a normal correction into an early Halloween. But we'll try to give you some early hints tonight. First, though, let's strengthen our nerves, remember those puppies, and look at the numbers. And as the Dow Jones Industrial Average indicates, there's never been another week like it, which is okay by me. With record rises following, but not matching the record decline, and with trading volume more than twice last week's previous record, the Dow could not be saved even by falling long and short-term interest rates and closed with a loss just shy of 300 points at 1950.76. And there were similar disasters throughout the broader market indexes, all of which are back to levels last seen in 1986. But looking here, a good record for the week for a happy change. Our elves have moved their technical market index all the way from minus one to plus six. Not only their first outright buy signal in nearly three and a half years, but by far the biggest one-week change they've ever reported. While the elves have sometimes been early, their long-term record has been superb. Let's hope they've got a bullseye tonight. But there haven't been many other places to hide, with precious metals, interestingly, almost unchanged for the week. Now, before we look ahead with our star panel of special guests, let's quickly seek perspective by seeing what has happened in the past, a pattern of ever-shortening recoveries after the fall. 
The Dow Jones Industrial Average had reached the highest point in its history, 381.17, September 3rd, 1929, before plunging in November to 198.69, losing more than half its value. It took a quarter century for that damage to be entirely repaired and the Dow to get back to its pre-crash number. Within those years of trying to catch up, the market had a post-war tumble in 1946 when the Dow fell 20% in less than two months. It took till 1950 to make up that loss. More recently, though, the Dow dived in 1962 from an all-time high of 723.53 in March to 535.75 in June a 26% bash, but all that was regained within a year. Will the age of compression move even faster this time? From its all-time high of 2722.42 this past August 25th, the Dow was down 36% at, mo at Monday's sickening close. Since then, it's gained 12%. As we wait to find out whether we've now seen the lows and how long the recovery will take this time, let's seek further perspective by looking at a chart that indicates the jury is still out on whether the great bull of the 1980s is indeed dead, as most commentators seem to assume this week, or merely deeply gored. This is the trail of the bull that was born in August 1982 and marched with not even as much as a 10% stumble after 1984 to a gain of more than 250% by this past August. At Monday's dismal close, the Dow still held almost exactly half its bull market gain. And since then, the market has moved up. Tonight, in fact, the Dow is actually higher than it was on the first trading day of 1987, and higher, in fact, than on every single day but one in its entire history before 1987. Small consolation, to be sure, for those whose pocketbooks were severely wounded this week, but useful in distilling the headline hysteria. To help further, we have three of Wall Street's giants with us tonight. Bill Schreier is chairman and chief executive officer of America's biggest brokerage firm, Merrill Lynch. And he's also vice chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. Steve Einhorn is co-chairman of the Investment Policy Committee at Goldman Sachs. And John Templeton, founder of the Templeton Funds, has over the last generation compiled what is quite simply the best public long-term investment record <coughs> in the business. Gentlemen, let's begin by asking each of you What's the single most important lesson of this week's debacle in Wall Street, Bill? Well, Lewis, uh, I think probably if I could sum it up in two words, I'd say uh, don't panic. Whether you be uh, an individual investor, an institutional investor, or one of the professionals that are, that are, that were, that are working in our business. So in two words, don't panic. S Steve, what would your words be? I think there are two elements um, that combine to bring about the most important lesson of the week. The first one is that there is uh, uh, a tolerance that the market has for inadvisable economic policies, but that tolerance is not indefinite. And the economic policy that they found intolerable was the large budget deficit. The second important lesson, I think, and critical, is that the world uh, or industrial countries must cooperate with each other in terms of economic policy. Confrontation is simply unacceptable in the conduct of economic policy. Cooperation is critical. John? Lewis, I would say that if, if you never buy investments with borrowed money, you can always be comfortable. Human nature is such, we're always going to have periods of enthusiasm and pessimism. <clears throat> Every 10 years, there'll be bull markets and bear markets. But if you don't have borrowed money, you don't have anything to worry about. Bill, you s tell people not to panic. Uh, do you tell them to buy? Well, I think it, uh, sure. I think it's time to, uh, after a, uh, a week like this, it's a good time for everybody to look at, uh, as they are now doing with American corporations, restructure their portfolios. Good time to take a look at what they have and what, the, what they might take a look at to uh, improve their portfolio in the, you know, in the weeks and months ahead. Why didn't you warn your customers this was coming? <laughs> well, I didn't know it was coming, Lewis. <laughs> I think uh, if I had to uh, describe uh, uh, the event in, in, a, in a short period of time we have here tonight, I kind of, somebody asked me about it, and I said it reminds me of the total eclipse of the sun. All the various negative events that, uh, that, uh, that Steve talked about and uh, others have this week all sort of came together at the same time. And uh, that led to the uh, incredible uh, activity and the decline on Monday. But uh, like an eclipse of the sun, 
It doesn't happen very often when it's that total and uh, doesn't last for very long. So I, that's kind of my simple analysis of it. Mm -hmm. well, let me speak to the customers. Mer Merrill Lynch gained its reputation as the firm that brought Wall Street to Main Street, as the champion of the individual investor. These days, you've got a lot of other activities. In fact, you're one of the principal users of this so-called program trading that was so controversial this week. Let me just read you a letter I got this week. It ends with a question. I'll let you answer the question. It's from one of our viewers, Barbara Navarro in Chicago. She says, what political body or government agency could we write to to suggest that a separate exchange be created for those not engaged in computer big block program trading? The little guy doesn't have a prayer, as evident on Black Monday. It's a shame that the supposed free market system, which has always been part of the American dream, has to be dictated by computer wars. What can be done for the small investor? I think that's a very good question. And uh, as a matter of fact, before I answer that directly, or try to answer it directly, I would say that uh, I don't think anybody should blame the decline on Monday on computerized trading. To me, it was simply the, the match in the gas tank that exaggerated to the extent that it did. All the other things were there, all the other uncertainties were there, and the and computerized trading was simply the, the tool, the mechanical tool that caused it to go to the extremes that it did. I think that uh, she can write to people. She could write to the SEC, who were asking for a review of it. Uh, I know that the, the New York Stock Exchange has had a thorough study of computerized trading that's going on for a couple of months since due to be released in, I think, the next two or three weeks. But I think before we're too hasty to jump, to a conclusion about computerized trading or program trading that we ought to uh, let a little uh, cooling off period, let the dust settle and really find out. Now, as for bringing Wall Street to Main Street, I think you know how all of us at Merrill Lynch feel about that. As a matter of fact, it's kind of ironic. Monday, the day of the big decline, was the birthday of Charles E. Merrill, our founder. And uh, he must have been uh, rolling around thinking about some things himself in that particular day. Are you but we lose? Still, we're still a champion of the small investor, and we, there's so many things that are right about it that uh, we just can't let one unusual event uh, mar the whole atmosphere. Steve, you mentioned that Wall Street's tolerance was not unlimited in these economic areas. The old story is, with a mule, you start by hitting him with a two-by-four to get his attention. Do we have the government's attention? I think absolutely. I think it's no surprise after a 500-point decline on Monday that President Reagan, for the first time, opens up the opportunity for tax increases to help narrow the budget deficit. It's no surprise after a day like Monday that the West German uh, finance minister and central bankers uh, allow for uh, lower interest rates. No surprise that Alan Greenspan um, uh, suggests that he will provide all the liquidity the system needs uh, to grow. We have the attention now of the policymakers. In 1982, the big bull market started right after they passed a big tax increase. Is that all you Wall Streeters want? More and more tax increases? No. Uh, I think rather than uh, a tax increase, what Wall Streeters want, so to speak, is a sound economic policy. And an element of that sound economic policy would be a balanced budget, or at least a budget deficit that is moving uh, to a lower number. They're talking about a $23 billion increase in revenues. Is that really going to turn around this multi-trillion dollar economy? No, and I don't think anybody expects it will, but it's a move in the right direction. I think all Wall Street would like to see is progress made on the budget deficit. Progress made on that deficit will help us improve our trade deficit and will also make us less reliant on foreign savings to fund our financial markets. When you were here in April, you predicted that the Dow this year would get to 2,700. It did? Was it just tired and ready to go down? Um, I think it was more than just tired. There were some uh, underlying fundamental deterioration. And that deterioration began um, in the summer months of this year. First and foremost, interest rates began to rise. And the level of interest rates became competitive uh, with common stock returns. Second, stocks had achieved a terribly unusual level uh, of value relative to earnings, dividends, and book value. Uh, third, liquidity in the system, money available to buy common stocks had declined. All of those things were going on underneath the market. It took something to bring investors to focus on them. John Templeton, the newspaper Variety, uh, recalled its famous 1929 headline this week. They said, Wall Street lays an egg, the sequel. You were around in 1929, although you weren't as active as you are today. What's the comparison? Uh, the panic this time was much greater, much larger. But at that time, the 
uh, stock market would have recovered within a year, except that the panic spread into general business conditions. And that I do not expect this time. Things are so different. At that time, there was no unemployment insurance. There was no guarantee of bank deposits. There was no insurance on brokers' accounts. There was no uh, social security and many other factors. So that this time, I think this is simply a, a stock market, a bear market in the stock market, and will be reflected in little, if any, decline in general business. President Reagan last night seemed to be at pains not to say we would not have a recession. He said that if we lost confidence, if Wall Street mood spread to the country that we could have a recession earlier than we might. Does that worry you? No, that is about the same thing as was said in 1929, but it's also said with every other bear market which has not increased in spread. It was said in the bear market of 1937 and 1942 and 1974, and usually it's true that nothing will happen this time except a temporary decline. I would go as far, Lewis, to say that I would be very surprised if there is any decrease at all in the amount of dividends paid out, I'd be very surprised if there was any decrease in the book values of corporations. I'd also be surprised if there was even a decrease in the sales volume of corporations. You have always taught that the successful investor looks for bargains. You must have some bigger bargains than a few days ago, do you not? Yes, indeed, Lewis. Um, you might say that we're being offered a great opportunity those who weren't uh, quick enough to get in on the ground floor when the bull market started in 1982 are now being offered a chance to get in on the ground floor of the next bull market. Your own industry, the mutual fund industry, has had a rocky week, massive redemptions, people told they couldn't redeem for seven days in many cases. Do you find in your own operation that people are panicking and trying to get out? Our redemptions this week have been less than one-tenth of one percent if, if switching from common stock funds into others. Overall, with all the funds together, there's been a net increase, not a redemption. What's your advice to people in terms of the stock market now? Patience, be a long-term investor, be prepared financially and psychologically to live through a series of bull markets and bear markets because in the long run, common stocks will pay off enormously. The next bull market will be carry prices far higher than this one. Why? Because the whole nation is growing more rapidly. Gross national product of the nation will double in at least the next 10 years. We think the gross national product of the nation 40 years from now will be 64 times as high as it is now. And that will be reflected in sales volume and profits and share prices. So that from a long-term investment standpoint, it's a question of when should you put your money into stocks. We can't give you the exact day but sometime the bull market will start again and you want to be in on it. So, Schreier, in 1974, when we had a pretty bad bear market, instead of being bullish on America, your firm was emphasizing all the other products it had to offer. This time you seem to be much more positively upbeat as a firm. Is there a change in attitude there? Well, no, I think the, uh, the uh, we just thought it was a very timely, uh, as you may know, we ran some uh, commercials in the World Series last night where uh, Jack yeah, we Lader told them not to play tonight, so... Yeah, they're going to play tonight, that's, exactly, that's right. But nevertheless, we, yes, we are very bullish on American, American corporations, and this is a story we're trying to get across. But you also sell bonds. The bond market had a terrific rally this week yeah. against the stock market. That's should, right. Should people sell stocks and buy bonds? Uh, yeah, there were some, yes, there were people uh, selling stocks and buying bonds. As a matter of fact, the bond markets uh, were, uh, had, had such, a, such a decline that there were some very good... Uh, buying opportunities, particularly in long-term bonds, and that seemed to work out well. Which looks better to you right now? I think it's a balanced approach, and I think each, each individual investor has to look at his own situation. If you're conservative, you ought to have a balanced portfolio. And you can get some good long-term bond purchases and certainly get some very attractive long-term common stock purchases. Of John Templeton, you were one of the earliest global investors. The markets seem to be tightly interlinked this week. One falls, they all fall. Was there any safety, safety and diversification this week? Some, but not as much in the old days when economies were more separate. Uh, we have found that by being world diversified, there, we have been able to make more, uh, been able to do better than the market in uh, bear markets, much better than in bull markets, and that's still true this week also. Barely two months ago, you were here with me, and you were totally optimistic about the future. Have you changed that attitude a little? No, 
Lewis, the out outlook is so wonderful that none of us really understand. Um, all the world is progressing more and more rapidly. Half of all that's been discovered in science is in the last 50 years. Half of all discovered in medicines in the last 20 years. There are 10 times as many shareholders now as there were 40 years ago. Uh, pension funds, uh, individual retirement accounts, and all growing so rapidly. And the, sh the quantity of shares available to buy is shrinking. So that in the long run, share prices are likely to be much higher than they've ever seen before. You and I may believe that, but what do you tell the individual who sees a market crashing the way this one's crashed, thinks he's at the mercy of computers and big money managers? How can he have any assurance that this is a reasonable way to prepare for one's future? By looking at history, there's never been a time when you could have invested, when, never in the last 40 years, been a time when you could have invested that you, on common stocks that you wouldn't have made money over a five-year period. Or to say it differently, uh, the great bull market did end two months ago on August 25th. We are already now well into a bear market. But it's possible the bear market has already ended. But if it hasn't ended yet, the chances are it will end by the end of next year. So all of us should start focusing on when can we get in in order to share in the next bull market. Neither they nor any other human, not even a newsletter writer or a computer analyst, can tell us precisely how low or how high this market will go. Those who pretend otherwise turn out eventually and invariably to be wearing only the emperor's new clothes, and not very elegantly either. Happily, though, we don't have to know the unknowable to make money as long-term, sensible, and patient investors who believe that whatever our political and economic problems, America is still a fine and resilient and promising country and that we want to own a part of its future. That's how I see it however bruised and battered most of us are feeling tonight. And we'll be back next week to what passes for normal around here, tracking America's shaken financial present, but more important, keeping faith with its future and going along for the ride. I hope you'll join me on that ride.